Good afternoon. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I would like to welcome you to our keynote session, Spotlight on Innovation, the Maker Revolution. And I'll pause until the music stops, and then I'll, then I'll continue. OK, great. Thank you. My name is Adam Lashinsky, and I'm a senior editor at large for Fortune Magazine based in San Francisco. We are delighted and honored to have with us uh, this afternoon, this evening, Chris Anderson, co-founder of 3D Robotics and the former editor of Wired Magazine. He is also the founder of DIY Drones, an open source community with 12,000 people and three factories around the world. He is the renowned author of the seminal book, The Long Tail, which changed our thinking about the possibilities of the World Wide Web, as more as the more recent book, Makers, the New Industrial Revolution. He will uh, speak for a while, and uh, he has also brought toys to show, which I'm sure everybody is excited about. And then he and I will speak for a while, and uh, I will ask you at that point to write questions for Chris on the blue cards that will be handed around, and they'll be sent up to me, and I will ask your questions. So without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Chris Anderson. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Um, I think I'm actually lavved here, so I may not have to uh, stand in front, behind the podium. Um, I'll try not to trip over the cords here. Um, uh, thank you. This is going to be fun. Um, I, I, I could not be um, more honored to be in front of this audience. Um, I've been to many, uh, many of these events, and they're always inspirational. I hope to live up to that standard. Um, I'm here to talk about technology in the, in the, in the long arc of history. Um, the subtitle of my book is uh, Makers of the New Industrial Revolution. And I just want to kind of remind you what a big deal industrial revolutions are. Um, the first industrial revolution, um, and there's much debate about you know, how many there have been and you know, exactly what defines industrial revolution, but I'm going to, for sort of, you know, I don't know, historical drama's sake, um, uh, mark the beginnings of the first industrial revolution as 1776, the same year as the American Revolution. It's um, Midlands of England and it's the invention of the spinning jenny. Now, the spinning jenny was the spinning wheel that you know very well from medieval times, um, but just several of them running in parallel, treadle powered by, uh, by a foot. And this allowed one person to spin multiple threads. That began, that, that sort of created the notion of force amplification. It, you now became more productive than you know, a single human could normally be. And, the foot power pedal was then replaced by water power with uh, the, the, the water frame, that water power, horsepower, steam power, and ultimately electric power. It created um, the, uh, a moment in history where we went from beast of burden to beast of brain, where it was less about our ability to you know, use our muscles to change the world and our own, or change our own world to ones where we use our brain to create machines that were stronger than our muscles. And this created not only you know, extraordinary increase in productivity and fabrics and textiles and silverware and ceramics that we couldn't, people couldn't otherwise afford and improve their, improve their quality of living, but it created the city. It created modernity, and this is, and this is how. Um, one of the side effects of the creation of the manufactory, which we now call the factory, um, was that it was all, it was, it was a, it was a, it was an, a building, it was a set of machinery organized around the motive force, organized around the engine, the power. Now, originally the power was water, and those factories were built around running, running water. And then it was steam, and they were built around the, steam, the boilers and the steam engines. And what they created was a concentration of people from the land where they were distributed in, in rural England to the cities where the engines were. People moved to the engines. People moved to the machines to allow the machines to generate goods at a rate that people could never generate on their own. And now we, we, we know we have this vision of those early days of the Industrial Revolution, the dark satanic mills, you know, um, not a good scene. But if you actually look at the statistics of humanity from that period, you find that the life expectancy in England doubled, the population grew by a factor of 10. 
that if you look at the history of humanity, and you, and you know, dating back to the beginnings of recorded history, and you measure things like life expectancy and population and quality of life, basically it's a flat line for as far as you can see, you know, the, you know, the stuff we read about, the, you know, the Roman Empire, um, you know, Jesus, Mohammed, the Renaissance, it's like invisible in terms of these core metrics of the human condition, like how many of us are there and how long do we live until we get to the Industrial Revolution, and then it skyrockets. Then, then you know, the world population explodes, life expectancy doubles, our health and happiness and quality of life measures go off the charts. What happened? What, I, we thought these were dark satanic mills. We thought this was a miserable experience where we serve the machines. What happened? And the answer is, in the process of concentrating people around the machines, we ended up building the infrastructure of modernity. When you put people together, you ended up sooner or later having to build sewage systems and access to clean water and schools and healthcare systems. And all of that infrastructure that we now know as the modern world and the city happened because we were so densely packed for the first time because we had to go to the machines that we had to build this. And in retrospect, those bucolic you know, English villages had damp walls and no sewage. And the water wasn't so clean. And they didn't have access to doctors and all that other stuff. And so ultimately, the act of moving to the city to serve the machines created a better standard of life. And that was just for our living conditions to say nothing of the products that we were able to buy, we had access to. Remember, it used to be hard to get clothes until machines started making them faster than, than, than a spinning loom could. Um, and then we, we, and we, got, we got the stuff that we defined the modern world. So that was the first industrial revolution. And you know, there were things that advanced it. Um, we went from steam power to electric power, the assembly line, mass production, interchangeable parts, all that kind of stuff. And that took us largely from the late 1700s to, you know, one could argue, the uh, late 1900s. Um, the second industrial revolution was the information age, the digital revolution. But I'm not actually going to start it at the invention of the computer, which you could argue was, you know, late, late 30s, early 40s, you know, around the World War II period. Um, because you know, the computer was essential, but it, the computer did not change the world. You know, there was a period, even in the 60s, where mainframes were the computer, and they were owned by big companies and governments, and, and you know, they, they ran the census better, but it didn't change your life. And then we invented the personal computer. In Steve Jobs and Wozniak in 1977, it was one of the first commercial ones, and that then got into our desktops. And we added, added the word personal and desktop to what was formerly an industrial task of computing, and we put power in the hands of everybody. And that, first with the personal computer and then the internet, changed the world. So it was the democratization of computing that, that ultimately became the second industrial revolution. And now our brain power was again augmented by machine power. So the first industrial revolution, muscle power, augmented by machine power. The second, brain power, augmented by machine power. The third industrial revolution, I would argue, is the combination of the two. This is digital and manufacturing. It's computers in the physical world. I'm going to give you one more historical analogy, just kind of you know, to kind of put us on the on the, the timeline of history. Um, how many people here owned um, one of the original Macintoshes in 1984, 19, around 84, 85, etc.? Good. Okay. How many had one of those first laser writers, 1985, 86? Wow, okay, terrific. So those were expensive. I mean, you are, you are, you are, you are true, true early adopters. They were $6,500. I think actually computer networking, the Apple, Apple Net was actually designed to share it because it was so expensive. But you'll remember the big deal at the moment was desktop publishing. Now we think nothing of this desktop publishing. It's just like it's like, you know, it's like it's built into your word processor right now. But if you think about it for a second, desktop publishing was the combination of an industrial word with the words desktop. And it, computing was the combination of industrial word computing with a personal word, personal, crystal computing. It took, remember, publishing prior to this was a factory job. It was a printing plant. Publishing was, you know, from Gutenberg on back. On, on forward, it was typographers' unions and guilds and terms of arts. And I mean, you know, the, the publishing was not something that regular people did. And you certainly were going to put the word desktop in front of it. And then along came Apple and the Mac and the laser writer. And now we had the ability to, 
to learn to do the things that used to require professional skills, you could do them yourself. Now, we made a mess of those first pages, a dog's breakfast of fonts. You remember that we had to learn the, the, the terminology, the terms of art of, of publishing, wraparound and kerning and leading and fonts and typefaces and all this kind of stuff, but we did. But that, that by itself was mind-blowing in, in its way, but didn't change the world. What it did is it turned publishing it turned publish into a button on some software, and it created, it turned bits on the screen, pixels, into atoms on the page, paper, ink, and it, but it did so in relatively small numbers. It did not destroy the New York Times. It did not destroy media. It didn't challenge media. It wasn't publishing in the grandest scale. Why not? The answer is that you could publish, but you couldn't distribute. You could make a page, but you couldn't make a million pages. And even if you could make a million pages, how are you going to get them to everybody? And then. 15 years later, we had the answer. That was the web. And then all those skills we learned, that, that sort of sense that we are empowered to publish, became a reality when publish became a button in your browser. And now every time, and probably everyone in this room has clicked that but publish button in the browser, and the moment you do that, think for a moment that you've basically taken you know, 500 years of industrial you know, skills, technology, terminology, and turned it into a button in your browser. You can just click, and poof, you can, you know, essentially reach seven billion people, if, you're, if your words are, are, worth, are, 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 are that interesting, you know, that we, that we have now democratized the power of full publishing, which is creation and distribution. Okay, that was, that, that was the analogy. That, that, was the, that was the first two industrial revolutions. Third industrial revolution, the combination of those two, is right about where the laser writer was, 1986. Um, this is, this is a 3D printer. This is a MakerBot. This is a very early MakerBot. It's a thingamatic. It's now virtually an antique. I'm lucky it's working at all. It's, by the way, it's printing a Darth Vader helmet in fluorescent neon green. Um, at, the end, at the end of this talk, I hope to have it, to be able to hand it to you as a, as a thank you gift. Um, this, is, this, is, this is basically the dot matrix printer of the third industrial revolution. This is, this is not yet the laser writer, but it is the, desk, the, the, the dot matrix printer. It's a little bit slow, it's a little bit noisy, it prints in one color at a time. My children complain about the resolution. <laughs> um, but today you can buy one um, that is closer to the laser writer. It's two colors, it's super fast, it comes in a box. This one's laser cut plywood and I don't want to talk about the firmware. Um, the, new, the new ones you buy, you just buy them in a box like a microwave oven, you plug them in and pff, they go. And now, and now in the same way publish became a menu item that you could pick on your computer, now make becomes a menu item that you can pick on your computer. Now this is not manufacturing in the real sense. You're not gonna make, I'm not gonna make enough I'm not going to make, make enough Darth Vader helmets for the two of us, much less all of you. But there's something magical about it. Remember, this is not just manufacturing, it's digital manufacturing. What's magical about it is that the file that I'm, I'm printing here was downloaded from the internet. And that file was actually to file the Darth Vader helmet. And the file was not, was not just downloaded from the internet. It was actually a modification of a file that was, down, that was uploaded to the internet from a free site called Thing, Thingiverse. And it was collaboratively built by the internet and shared and traded and cre you know, created by the web's innovation model. And now we have something different. Now we have the notion of everything we've learned over the last 20 years about working together online in bits, we can now apply to atoms. These are atoms coming out. We took bits from the internet and these are coming out as atoms. And that's exciting. That means that you know, we don't need those skills. We don't need to be talented at design. We can download things from the internet. We can remix them. We can change them, et cetera. OK, that's pretty good. But it's still not manufacturing. How do we get to manufacture? How do we get to competing with the mass production industry of the world? And the answer is because it's digital, it can be uploaded to the cloud. And that same file, which I'm printing one of here, I can print a million of by just clicking elsewhere. And today, um, uh, I'm going to give you a couple homework assignments. Um, the first homework assignment is this. If you have uh, an, an iOS device, an, I, an iPhone or an iPad, um, is it OK if I let them do it right now? Um, I don't mind, sure. OK, this will distract you. Go to, the, um, go, go to your app store. And um, I need you to download uh, two apps. Um, number one is uh, called 123D Catch. And it's from Autodesk, 123D Catch. Well, spell, spell catch. Ca catch is C-A-T-C-H, catch, like catch a ball. OK. OK. Um, what you're going to be downloading is a 3D scanning application that uses the camera on your phone 
to do what's called reality capture. Um, and what you're going to be able to do, don't do it here because it's, the lighting's not right, et cetera, but when you get home, what you do is take something, a coffee mug, put it on the table and go click, 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 click with, your, with the camera on your phone. It will upload it to the cloud and it will create a 3D scan, a polygonal mesh. Um, you've now done 3D scanning, you've done reality capture, it's free on your, on your iPhone. Okay, after you've done that and you bring down that mesh, then I want you, to, here's the second thing, um, I downloaded an app called 123D Design, and this is CAD software. CAD software was like desktop publishing software. It used to be hard. It was $6,000 a seat. You needed to go to school to learn it. You know, just even the words CAD, computer-aided design, very intimidating. Um, now, as you'll see, it's free and it works on your phone or your iPad. That mesh, once you bring it down, you're gonna modify that mesh, and I would like you to put to change it, make the handle of your coffee cup longer, put your name on it or something like that. And then upload it to, if you, if you don't have a 3D printer, and most, most of you probably don't, <laughs> upload it to a site called Shapeways, and have it printed in, depends on how wealthy you are, if you're really feeling flush, have it printed in, in, in sterling silver. If you're not, have it printed in plastic. Um, but, just, but just do it. And then, you know, two weeks later, it'll show up. And then there, there you've done. You've just done, like, you've just done, you photocopied reality, right? You've just done 3D scanning, 3D design, 3D printing, and you did it on your phone, and you did it for free. Well, the, the printing may, bit may cost you a bit. But, um, but it's, it'll cost you 20 bucks. Um, that's kind of amazing. I mean, that is new. That is what desktop and personal, and that's what democratization of technology means. Okay. So there you've done it. Now you've done that, that whole process. You now understand the kind of prototyping stage. You're still not manufacturing. However, if you really, really like your modification to that coffee cup, um, I'd encourage you to go to another site like Alibaba or MFG.com and pick a site and ask them to make you 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever. And they'll take that same file and they'll say, can do. <laughs> what kind of material would you like? When would you like it? And they take credit cards. They'll take PayPal. And you can get robots in China to work for you. And they take PayPal. And now we have all the necessary elements. We've got, we've got the three magic words of the third industrial revolution. We've got desktop. Desktop means democratize. It means everybody. It means inclusive, collaborative. It means, it means us, power to the people. We've got digital. These are driven by files that can be shared and traded online and take advantage of the web's innovation model. And we've got the cloud, which is to say that we can harness the biggest factories in the world from your desktops, from our, from our browsers, by just uploading these files out there. The same way that every time you check your Gmail, you're harnessing a factory. It's server farm. There's massive, massive machines out there which, is, which work for you for a nanosecond. Um, same thing. Manufacturing is now in the cloud. Those factories of the world are now open to anybody and they read the same digital files that run this machine. That, those three elements, desktop, digital, and cloud, are the necessary ingredients of the third industrial revolution where we take everything we've learned from the web, the fantastic you know, reinvention of innovation, reinvention of the, of the architecture of participation, you know, the, what we've done to the media industry and elsewhere by giving these powerful tools to everybody, and now we take it to the biggest industry in the world, which is manufacturing. So my tagline for this, for you know, my, my, my article in Wired was, atoms are the new bits. Uh, but the point is, is that we now have the opportunity to take the web generation, the web's innovation model, and apply it to the real world. And it starts now. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Chris, my, oh, first I should say I have a confession to make. At the, I was a little annoyed when we were starting that music that was playing. That music was this Much damn machine right here. <laughs> it's, it's really a, loud. It's a sad calliope. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, was, I got over that, that moment of, of, uh, of aggravation, and, and after listening to you speak, I find I feel so good. I feel so happy about this message, that, 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 because you're, you're, you're illustrating this new world that's going to be wonderful. I, I, um, I, I forgot to tell you about the, my, my, my last homework assignment. <laughs> okay. Um, I also, is... I expected to feel anxious when you said the words homework assignment, but I, fo I felt nostalgic when you said that. Oh, <laughs> good, good. Um, so just to remind you, the first two homework assignments for people with iOS devices is 1, 2, 3, to catch, 1, 2, 3, to design. Just play with it, it's free. Okay, your next time, assi homework assignment, this is going to require a little show of hands, if I may. Okay, how many people here have uh, used a 3D printer? 
Very few. Uh, th uh, th three, th four, or five, five, five or six hands. hands. Okay, yeah. how many of you own a 3D printer? Are we actually down to zero? Nobody. Nobody in this room owns a 3D printer. Okay. Except you. Except for me. How many people here have children at home? All right, now we're getting somewhere. Can you Not see that where, many, can, can, can you see where I'm going here? <laughs> okay, last question. How many of you, and again, this may be a slight generational test, how many of you, when you were growing up, your parents bought a home computer? Home computer? Home computer? All right. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So you know how they bought that home computer? A home computer. It wasn't like a computer for every kid. It was like one for the home, right? And why? It was like expensive. It was like 25 bucks. What kind did you get? Your parents get you. Or a gateway, I think. Yeah, it was, it was a gateway. So, yeah, it, it was, was later. It was later. Okay, yeah. so we had, we had like an Atari or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, it was expensive. They had no idea what it was for. It was clearly, it's like yeah. maybe so you could learn programming. Wasn't quite sure. We ended up playing video playing games, games, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. But, yeah. but you know, here we are, right? I mean, changed my life. Probably changed your life as well. Okay, so here's where I'm going with that home computer analogy. For those of you who have children at home, the 3D printer is the new home computer. This, it's ready. It's ready. It's no, it's not, it's not circuit boards. It's not like laser cut. You don't have to program anything. It is now time. It's cheaper than that home computer. It is time to get a 3D printer, do it for their birthday, do it for the holiday season, bring one home today. I brought one home to my kids. My, ch my, my children use it every weekend. My girls do dollhouse furniture. My boys make Warhammer mechs. They're probably violating some intellectual property. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, but the point <laughs> is, my kids are growing up believing that anything they can imagine, they can make real. Digital design is their native language. In the same way that the home computer gave us 21st century skills, a 3D printer will give your kids 21st century skills. If you, digital design is like the native language of kids. They're growing up with video games, they understand polygons, they understand 3D environments on 2D spaces. They are so ready. Get them a 3D printer, it'll change their life. So first of all, where do I, where do I buy one? Uh, there's tons and tons of them. This is a MakerBot, um, and uh, the new MakerBot's called the Replicator 2. Um, I'm a big fan of MakerBot. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not associated with them, um, but uh, it's about $2,200. You go on the web to get this? Go on the web, MakerBot.com. Um, there are others. Uh, 3D Systems has a very cute, um, very cute one uh, called the Cube, uh, which is about, um, I'm going to say, $1,200. I mean, they go all the way down to about $600. And are and they getting sold cheaper. at retail? I mean, you go to Best Buy and get one? Can I, you, you? Can't, you can't go to Best Buy, but give me, about, give me two years and you will be able uh -huh. to. Um, so, but so but it's ready. You, you, they come in a box, you plug them in, they work. So I can... I remember, I had a, a childhood friend who had a computer in his house long before I did, and I do remember, I think it was an Apple IIe or something, mm. and I remember we did absolutely nothing with it other than play this, you know, what now seems to be a very primitive game. And as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, I can't imagine why I would want one of these, and then you gave me two real examples of, of things that your children are doing, and it, it starts to make sense, at least the beginning part of the story makes sense. I, um, uh, the, the best part about what my children doing it is, A, they're... They're using technology, which I'm always desperate for them to do. Uh, the second is that the way they get their, the girls get their dollhouse furniture. I've got five kids and three girls, and, and um, you know, they're, they, uh, they want to play video games, right? You know, and, but we have rules, two hours per weekend day, and we have this little Hello Kitty timer, and when it goes off, ding, you're done, right? <laughs> you know, put the screen down, walk away from the keyboard. That's when the negotiating and the arguing, uh, yeah, the arguing it's starts. Yeah, it, it, it's not pretty. And um, they're, they're like, uh, my girls play a game called The Sims, The Sims 3, which is like a virtual dollhouse. It's a great game. Um, and they're like, I'm like, you girls, you've got a dollhouse. Go play with your real dollhouse. And like, Dad, it sucks. <laughs> you know, I need new furniture. Because um, they've been, been doing this building, this, they were doing like, like the Mad Men, um, they're doing like 1950s Mad Men kind of, kind of scene in, in, in The Sims, and they're like, Dad, can you buy me some new furniture? So I know the answer is no, but I need to kind of get to know. So we go online and we, um, we research uh, dollhouse furniture, and I'm now going to give you three complaints about the dollhouse furniture cartel. <laughs> <laughs> Number one is crazy expensive, right? Like a, a, a kitchen set with like three pieces is like 30 or 40 bucks. Number two, um, there's very little choice. There was absolutely no Madman styles. You get, you get sort of like, you know, you, get, you got like, you know, one sort of rustic America. You got one sort of like maybe like Kings or Queens. I wasn't sure. And that, that, that was it. Um, and number three, there was no standardization of size. Uh, it turns out dollhouse furniture comes all, dollhouses come in all different sizes. Dollhouse figures come in different sizes, which are not the same as the dollhouse. You're saying there's no building the code. For, there's for no it. building code. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and it turns out that like, the furniture has to be like, 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 like slightly um, bigger than the dollhouse, but smaller than the figures, because the figures don't bend properly. And 
And you only find this out when you bought it in Amazon and it shows up and it ain't right. And so, hold on. so let's let's stipulate that your your children are um, extraordinary, are actually are unusual. By which I mean extraordinary, like their father, and that they're they're ahead of the curve. They're 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 doing this. Um, let, let's try to let's try to put your thesis in, in some context. So, and let's start with your analogy. Around. Well, I haven't I haven't told you what they did, uh, how, how they solved that problem. So solve the, the, the problem of the, the dollhouse furniture oh, problem. Oh, please, yeah. The, yeah. So so anyway, the simple answer is, is that I, I said um, we're not buying it, but we do have a MakerBot. We do have a three D printer. Go to Thingiverse. Knock yourself out. And so they go to Thingiverse and they find this awesome, awesome dollhouse furniture, or furniture, more to the point, and they, they download exactly the right one. They pull, drag a little slider to get it just the right size, and they print it, and then they paint it, and they love it. And the best part of the story is how did that furniture get on Thingiverse? And the answer is that this woman who goes by the name of Pretty Small Things, who's a set designer in Broadway in New York, that, that the way they design sets is that you do them in 3D CAD programs and they 3D print them and if they like them, they turn into a proper full size set. But once they're done, what do you do with those files? Give them away, put them on Thingiverse. And so what turns out, my kids don't know this, but what turns out what they are, what their dollhouse furniture is some Broadway set furniture. That's neat. And it's all free. It's open source is the nature of it. It's Creative Commons, creative licensed, commons. et cetera, yeah. Okay, so, so to so to but to put your anecdote in, in context, the your, the ramifications of that would be a, a new kind of an industry, a threat to the to dollhouse makers as a metaphor. So no, and I'm I, I, I'm serious. And so let's go back to your analogy to custom publishing. I will I will challenge you by saying the following: What custom publishing truly changed? Was it put out of work a lot of a lot of printers, a lot of people who worked in printing plants, typographers and such? Yeah. What it didn't change was the fundamental nature and makeup of the profession of publishing. And I'm not saying it didn't change the players, but here we are, however many years later, lots of people can sit in their jammies and, and type up a newsletter or put cat videos on YouTube. But the fact of the matter is that the the brands that matter in publishing remain brands like Wired Magazine and Fortune Magazine and new brands that have grown up but are not DIY blogs. They are now a conglomerations of brands of publishing blogs. Publishing and so and such, the yeah. way publishing happens, ha in fact, hasn't changed at all. Well, you know, so I, th I think w you're, you're using words like publishing, which have a very distinct meaning. Let me, let me, let me you, you, it's a very sort of supply-driven taxonomy. You're talking about, about who makes stuff. Let's go to the demand side. Let's talk about what we read. If you had just, in your, if you had to sort of, I could like put a little sort of, you know, spy cam on you and watch your <laughs> reading behavior, what percentage of what you read do you think comes from publishers versus, you know, the, the, you know, the great unwashed cat video crowd, as, 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 you know, to, to use your phrase. I mean, I'm talking about YouTube videos, I'm talking about social, yeah. Facebook, I'm talking about tweets, I'm talking about blogs. I'm, so if I had to guess, you know, just fraction of words, what fraction of words do you think today are professional versus amateur? Well, you ask two different questions. What percentage of what I read is professional versus amateur, and what percentage is professional versus amateur? No, no, I meant you read. Okay, I, I, I think I'm unusual. I mean, I, I, think, I think the vast majority of the words I read are, are professional. I do read things on Facebook and Twitter. Many of those, the great majority of those, then point me to some professional uh, different point. Content. Yeah. The, the question is how okay, maybe I should have asked the question another way. What fraction of the words that you read are paid words? In other words, someone was paid to write them. Yeah. I still think the vast majority, but you, you would you would disagree with I, I you know, I think yeah. probably every one of you has a different balance, but yeah. we can agree that it's a mix of the yeah. two. Yeah, right? a larger mix than there was twenty and years ago. And a larger ago. mix than there was twenty years ago. And maybe someday it'll be kind of maybe half and half, right? There's still a place I wrote a book called The Long Tail, which is about, you know, that you know, the new class of niche media, which isn't necessarily driven by, by, by business models. And you know, the biggest misunderstanding of the long tail was that it was the end of the mainstream and the end of the mass, and it's not. It's the end of the monopoly yeah. of the mass. So what the web did is it broke the monopolies of our former, of my former business and your current business, which is the monopoly over 20th century culture and conversation by the professional publishers. Totally agree with that, but, but where, I'm, where I'm driving to this, and I feel like there's a comparison with, I don't know, electoral politics. You know, in the United States, over the history of the country, 
political parties and people have come up with new ideas, formed new parties, and they always get subsumed by the two major parties. That has to do with our electoral college system, et cetera. But similar things happen in the business world. And even in the Industrial Revolution, I mean, I think people used to take home piecework, right? Isn't that the expression? They would, the, they would sew at home until they... Well, well the cottage industry... Cottage was, industry, was, right. The cottage industry was actually essentially that. It was sort of distributed labor for the factories. Typically, the cottage industry wasn't selling directly to customers. They were... They were um, Let's say they're actually, you know, what they were, the right way to describe it is they were load balancing for the factories, which is to say, when the factories yeah. had a little, had too much work for the main machines, they would, they would, they would piece work it but, out. But the factories got so good that the cottage industries Absolutely. faded. Now, I would manufacturing is notoriously low margin, and I would assume that there's very little margin. Tell, tell that if, to Apple. Uh, <laughs> they're not in the manufacturing business; they're in the design business, but. Well, just because you, you don't own the factory doesn't mean you're not in the manufacturing business, to my point about the cloud. They commission it. That, that, that's fair. But to take what you talked about earlier, I order 10,000 mugs from China, but now I've got to sell them. Fortunately, Walmart is not your only choice anymore. <laughs> You know, the Kickstarter crowd, the Etsy crowd, the Indiegogo crowd, we've recognized that the Tell internet, everybody who you're talking about, uh, Kick, Kickstarter, uh, Etsy, Indiegogo. See my watch? It's a Pebble smartwatch. I love my watch. Do you have it's a Pebble neat. smartwatch? No, yeah. no, I'm okay. very Let me envious. shake it so the light comes on. Um, so this is a, this is a, this, this watch is connected to my phone, and when I get like text messages, it shows my watch buzzes and I get phone calendar alerts, etc. Um, but um, you know, but uh, it's it'll soon do smarter things. Like it'll have RunKeeper on it and you know track my activity and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, it's a cool watch. Um, this watch was created by four kids in Palo Alto. Um, it was, it was launched on a site called Kickstarter. And Kickstarter is what's called a crowdfunding site. And uh, it does three miraculous things. Um, when you put, you put a project on the Kickstarter and you say, I'd like to raise $100,000, um, and if I do raise $100,000, then I'll make it. And um, the way, the, what happens is that you, um, is that, uh, you basically, you're, you're, although you, technically, you're, I mean, technically you're not pre-ordering it, but essentially what you're doing is you're pre-ordering the product. And if enough people pre-order the product, it, it, it happens, it's made. Um, and this was a few months late, but by and large, it, 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 it worked. Now, when they do that simple thing of pre-ordering a product, I know Kickstarter hates it when you say pre-ordering because that's not what they do. They say that's technically it's not pre-ordering, but that really is what they do. Because there's some legal and commercial some issues legal, around exactly. why it isn't. And it might not show up, and they can't be sued for not delivery. Um, but what happens is you move money forward in time. The, the usual model of like you know taking venture capital, getting a big bank loan, because all the costs are up front, R&D, tooling, supply chain management, inventory, all this kind of stuff. Then it gets into the distribution channel. Then at the end, people buy it, and then you get paid. If you just get, if they pay you at the beginning of the process, you don't have to get the VC and the bank loan and, and mortgage your house. So it moves money forward in time. Number two, it. Um, it does market research. Um, you get all these people, they're not just buying a product, they're joining a revolution, they're commenting, they ask features. It's like, and this watch has changed like five times since it was first announced. It, people said, water resistant, I'd like waterproof. Done. You know, Bluetooth 3, come on, it's 2013, but Bluetooth 4, done. I'd like more colors, done, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so they listened, and so now all these people who are like contributing and pre ordering and commenting, now they feel like they're part of it, and now they're the best evangelist ever. Um, and number three, it builds a community. Um, those, those, these customers are now like the, you know, the Pebble Watch army. And they, you know, you don't need, who needs marketing when your customers are like, go Pebble, go Pebble, or slightly, where's my Pebble, you know, for, for some of the grumpy ones. But anyway, they are super engaged. <laughs> um, so the, the, the point is, 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 is simply that um, on the same week that Pebble, four kids in Palo Alto launched their watch um, on Kickstarter, Sony released their smartwatch. Have you ever heard of the Sony smartwatch? No. Has anybody ever heard of the Sony smartwatch? No. Oh, we have a gentleman who has heard. Do you own a Sony smartwatch, sir? No. <laughs> um, four kids in Palo Alto kick Sony's ass. That's the make a movement. There's, there's, two sep there's two separate issues, though, I think it's worth unpacking. One is the ability to raise money. The, uh, the other is the ability to for a manufacturer to have a community and to get commentary. I think that, that not only is the way of the future, but it's here. All good consumer facing and non-consumer non facing companies for that matter have gotten better at soliciting the opinion of their customers, right? But, but you know, the web natives do it better than anybody. And, and Kickstarter is, uh, is basically the, the retail, the retail or sort of R&D arm of the web 
the web generation. And so for, your, for people who are either doubt your thesis or like me who want to play devil's advocate with you because I would never doubt you. Thank you. Is, um, you're, you're, it, you're, you're replicating the arguments that you had with people several year, years ago over the long tail where the, the poo-pooers would say, what you're describing is very interesting, but it's incremental. It's yeah, niche, and it will never be trivial, et cetera. And that's where you and, and that's what the, the the devil's advocate position again would be, well, this this is very fringe, this 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 pebble thing is lovely, but I don't know if it's Sony, but somebody else will 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 step on them. Uh, and in the physical world, there's very take take autos. You wrote about autos in your book. Yeah. Talk about, I can't remember, it's uh, local, local motors. motors. Local motors Talk yeah. about local motors. And, because, and where I'll challenge you yeah. is there have been many new auto companies over the last 20 years. The only one that seems to be gaining any traction, Tesla, has done things in a very big way. They are not niche. Yeah, yeah. Fair point. Um, so um, the reason I brought in cars is that you know it ain't an industrial revolution if it doesn't extend to cars, right? <laughs> this is like the very ultimate well man manufactured yeah. product. And so I felt that it was kind of, you know, it was, you know, to test the thesis, you need to sort of see whether you at least had a, a glimmer of hope of doing it. Um, Local Motors is a, um, is a, it's a crowdsourced car company. Um, they, um, you know, they, they, they have contests and you can design, you design the, you know, the body and once that's done, you design the rear view mirror and then there's a competition for that. And, and it's just like, you know, there are so many frustrated, so many would-be car designers out there who don't, in fact, have jobs in the car design world. It turns out that the um, Art Center in Pasadena is like the, the number one automotive um, design center. And I was hearing some statistic that something like 20% of the graduates of the Art Center in automotive, uh, automotive design actually go into working for a car company, and the rest of them do like toothpaste tubes or something, I don't know what. But you know, by day they do toothpaste tubes and God bless them, but by night they still dream of designing cars. Yeah. And this was the place they could do it. It's called Local Forge, and they could, they could participate. And, and, um, and not only that, but once they design the car, then um, it's like, oh, what about all those regulations, you know, the crash testing and the airbags, and it's like, it turns out there's a little loophole, which is that if a car, if any product, and this is true for airplanes as well, if a product is at 51% or more than 50% assembled by the consumer, all bets are off. So it's like a kit, right? Right, exactly. Uh -huh. It's like, like, like a lot of that kind of yeah, consumer liability because it's like, hey, you build it, you know, you, 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 know, you deal with it. And so, and so you, know, you don't have to get crash testing. Now, now, you may argue that you would like a car that has an airbag and you'd rather have a car that's been through the crash testing process and this is not the car for you. Yeah, I would say to you, how, do, <laughs> how does this constitute progress? To the t it's, a, it's a Baja racer. It is designed to be raced in the, in the sands of Baja, and okay. it is an amazing Baja racer, which you will not buy from any other source. And, and you know, maybe someday they'll find one that's a little bit more street legal, or sorry, actually it's technically a street legal, but they'll find a little one that's a little more mainstream. But still, they, they, you know, it's niche, but it does exist. I'm gonna plunge into, uh, by, by the way, I, uh, you, quick, quick question. Am I correct? Would I be correct in assuming that you enjoy these uh, these these uh, accusations that that you know your thesis is is niche, is fringe, it's never going to happen, it's never going to be a big deal? I, I, I love the fact that the first pe first generation of people who doubted the long tail are now out of business because the long tail destroyed them. <laughs> um, and let's not even talk about my next book, Free. Um, <laughs> um, you know, no, I don't. I mean, look, you know, I, I think these are completely legitimate concerns. And this is, by the way, this gets knocked everybody in Silicon Valley. Everybody in Silicon Valley deals with the, you know, the sort of the poopers uh, initially. I mean, uh, I, I, Elon Musk is one of my. I think he mentioned him in Tesla. Elon Musk is one of my heroes, right? This guy, this guy just like talk about go big or go home. It's like he's decided he's going to do space, cars, and renewable energy. That's Tesla, SpaceX, and Solar City. I mean, you know, these are so each one of these is like the hardest manufacturing, engineering, et cetera. And they're all world changers, and he's doing all three. And, you know, he, doubters have been on him. And maybe one of the three will fail, maybe two of the three, maybe all will fail. But, but he's already had some measure of success with each of them. But, I mean, you know, I mean, I used to be in Europe. You know, I was in, you know, I was worked for The Economist, and I was in London, and I would go to, like, Europe in the, uh, in the um, late 90s. And I was the Internet guy. And they're like, yeah. Is this more of this American pixie dust, you know, this more of this, more of this, this is Hollywood, you're just trying to shove down our throat. We've got Minitel, you know. Anyway, they don't say that anymore. So to, uh, to your questions, and first one from Twitter, which is can you discuss the issues of copyright and infringement that the maker movement uh, brings up? Great, great question. Um, boy, what a can of worms. Um, okay, so I told you that my, um, 
my daughters download um, dollhouse furniture. Um, my boys download um, Warhammer figures. Uh, Warhammer is this board game, and it's made by with like, like these little sort of plastic figures, and it's made by a company called Games Workshop. And um, uh, they're quite expensive, they're really beautifully done. Um, and um, there's this weird thing, this is my second complaint. My first complaint was about size standardization of the dollhouse industry. My second one is going to be about, about um, um, part count mismatch in Warhammer kits. They come with 11 figures, but 10 bases. Do not ask me why. <laughs> the base is just like this disc. And so my boys say, um, Dad, will you please buy me a box of, of Warhammer figure bases? Now again, once I'm again, I know the answer is no, but we have to get to no. And I'm like, no, we have a 3D printer. You can see it kind of all I answer. <laughs> Every time my kids say, Dad, can I? It's like, no, we have a 3D printer. Um, so I said, no, we have a 3D printer. A base is a disc. Let's just draw a disc. We draw a circle you know, on our little one to 3D you know, design. Actually, we went to Tinkercad, which is a free website. We draw the circle, we extrude it, we print it. It's like, bingo, done. And it works great. And then I do what one does, which is I upload it to Thingiverse. And, um, and, and then it says, like, title your thing. And I said, um, Warhammer 40K base. And I, like, post it, and it's a disc, and it's there. And then, like, like 10 minutes later, the first comment comes in, dude, you are in such trouble. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming after you. Just wait. DMCA takedown. You, you know, change it quick while you can. And I was in the media business at the time, and I thought, this will be fun. I think that'd make a good story. Let them come after yeah, me. Yeah, you help sell books. Help sell books. <laughs> it might be a good magazine story. You know, <laughs> I wish I could tell you that they came after me, that they didn't. They ignored me entirely. So I said, look, I, I can't. This is this, I'm not going to let that happen. So I went after them. And I said, dear, game, dear Games Workshop, um, I just put this design. I put a, one of your bases on, on Thingiverse. You got a problem with that? And they said, um, I said, I said, it's a circle. Come on, you're not going to claim intellectual property over a circle. And they said, what'd you call it? And I said, I called it a Warhammer. Oh, good. <laughs> trademark infringement. I was like, OK, fair point. They said, the moment you called a Warhammer 40K base, you're acknowledging you've taken our intellectual property. So, and I went around and looked at what everybody else did. And they said, they said uh, base for uh, board game figures, and in the, in, the, in, the, in the sort of description section, it says, is it base, base for Warhammer, for, sorry, base for game figures, board game figures? Do not use it for Warhammer 40K. If you want a base for Warhammer 40K, buy it from Games Workshop. They're the best. You wrote this? No, no, this is what everybody else wrote. And so uh. why do they write that? And the answer is when you type Warhammer 40K into the search box, it'll come up. <laughs> so clearly this is not the ultimate answer to the whole intellectual property question. It is, um, you know, and the problem comes down to this. We know how to protect intellectual property for words and pictures and music and video, and it's called copyright. And copyright protects the creative arts. Okay, this, here's this glass, right? Okay, what part of this is the, is cr the creative arts? What part of this is copyright versus patent versus trademark versus God knows what? So I just told you guys that you can now don download an app called 123D Catch, and I told you about Thingiverse, and I told you about Shapeways and design, et cetera. So now here, here's a last sort of fun exercise. If any of you have any Disney figurines or, or Hello Kitties or any kind of famous things, uh, they, just, just, just take a picture of them, you know, do, you know, do the scan, send the design up to Thingiverse, and wait. And let's find out what, what law exactly you've broken. I don't know the answer. Um, don't call it Mickey Mouse. Just, just make it be Mickey Mouse. And how many polygons is piracy? You're not selling it. You're giving it away. You can take a picture. I think you can actually you know this is. Can I take a picture <laughs> of, my, of a Mickey Mouse doll and put it on Instagram? I have no idea. It doesn't sound right to me. So <laughs> taking a picture of my toys, I'm not allowed to take a picture of my children's toys and put them on Instagram? Uh, what if Facebook slaps an ad on that, on that Instagram page? Shouldn't they share that revenue with Disney? That's a Facebook question. I, the question <laughs> is, the question is have, have I broken the law? Yeah, I understand. Have I, so, so if I can take a picture of my children's toys and, and put, them on, put it on Twitter, that's a 2D image. Why can't I put a 3D image of the same thing? And how, how good does the resolution have to be before I've broken a law? And what law exactly is it that I've broken? And I mean, there, are, there may be a lawyer in this room who knows the answer to this, but nobody I've talked to has given me a satisfying answer yet. And I think this is going to be playing out court by court, case by case, country by country for decades. Here's, I think you should be concerned because I think they were afraid to go after you when you were the editor of Wired Magazine, but now they're going to be all over you as a, you know, an entrepreneur. Bring all it right. on. <laughs> we have, uh, I can see you're worried about this. So we have um, two jobs-related questions. I'm just going to read both of them to you um, carefully. And both both um, question askers have identified themselves as students, by the way. Uh, as a student, I see the future and the economy as something extremely important. How do you see this, ma this maker revolution 
affecting jobs? Will small businesses grow or will the ability to build things at home reduce large companies' uh, revenue? And the other question asks, as the technology of robotics advances, will robots allow for a reduction in the workforce as the cotton gin did? And since it's more advanced, is this a threat to the more educated workforce? You are scaring the young people of America. <laughs> well, well, let me first you know, reassure the, that those particular students, it is not a threat to the educated workforce of America. It might be a threat to the uneducated right. workforce of America. Um, so um, let me show you another prop, if I may. Um, so so th this, is a, this is a drone. This is what we make. It's a fully autonomous flying robot. Costs about 600 bucks. Um, it's made by, made by robots. It is a robot made by robots. There's some people involved as well. Um, we, we make it in a, a pick and place machine. The electronics and the hardware and fiber elements and cases and all this kind of stuff. It's made by, uh, by a, an automated um, a production uh, facility that uh, we own. We own one in San Diego. We run one San Diego, one Tijuana. Um, uh, we, um, the reason we use robots to make stuff is because you, there's no other way to make electronics. It's just too fiddly. It's too fine pitch. We do it, we do it for quality reasons. Um, the reason we use so many robots is because we are competing with China. Um, we want, we have a short supply chain. Um, we basically are 10 minutes, 20 minutes across the border from San Diego and Tijuana, so we, we can make, turn things around 24 hours, as opposed to shipping, doing thing, having things made in China 9,000 miles away. And um, We just finished Chinese New Year. Chinese, Chinese New Year is just a slight rant. Chinese New Year is two weeks long. <laughs> but the disruption to the global supply chain is like six weeks long. It is, it is, it is like National Reconsider Globalization Month. It's like, why do we have stuff made in China again? And every year we do it again. It's like, ah, it happened again. So we decided to put an end to it. And so we, we built our factories in, in, in Mexico. Uh, my my co-founder, Jordi Munoz, is Mexican, so it was, it was, it was easier. Um, and um, the only way we, and the way, way we compete with China is we use robots. And the great thing about robots is that we all buy robots for the same price. They have leveled the playing field about labor. A thousand years of globalization were driven by labor arbitrage, going to cheaper labor, as labor becomes a shrinking fraction of the cost of a product, we all buy robots for the same price, then suddenly you can be driven by time, not money. And the driving force of globalization can become time economics rather than monetary economics, and that is a big deal because now you want things close. And when things are close, they are fast, and they're innovative, and they're flexible, and they're more environmentally sustainable, and it's, it's, it's all good. So, um, so, that, so, that is, so that, that's, that's, what robot, that's what automated factories do. Now, what about jobs? Well, yes, we, um, we don't, the number of jobs per unit is less, but we're creating jobs. We have 62 employees um, right now. Uh, we, we create about one job in the United States, one design job for every two manufacturing jobs we create in Mexico. And these are jobs that we are bringing back to North America. Now the question is, are we, are we gonna compensate for the jobs that were lost in the 80s and the 70s? And the answer is no. We're not going to create as many jobs as we lost back then. But we are creating a different nature of jobs. And I would ask, you know, let me ask you a question. What happened to the typing pool? Remember the typing pool? What happened to the typing pool? Where did they go? I guess they got, they got, they got other jobs. Does anybody know where the typing pool went? Anyone, any guesses? Desktop publishing. Desktop publishing, okay, that's part of it. You got a guess? Anybody have a guess where the typing pool? It, it, they, by and large, they by and large got better jobs, right? They worked up, they became accountants or, or you know, I don't know, desktop publishers or spreadsheet jockeys or, or something. They, they, got, they got better jobs. And that's typically, I mean, factory jobs are not great jobs. And our CNC operators, the CNC is one of these machines that cuts away stuff. Our CNC operators, as the CNC machines get more robotic, what do they do? Do they sit there, you know, they sit there complaining about how their jobs are, you know, drifting away? No. They design new stuff. Our CNC operators have become our designers. And you know, once they get so good at it, we take them off the CNC line and we put them on the R&D line. Chris, the, um, in reviewing your, your book, the Guardian newspaper wrote, there are no dark clouds in Anderson's futurist sky. And they say that like it's a bad thing. Well, <laughs> because I'm here to tell you that there are dark clouds in the sky. So for example, questioner in the audience asks, you can 3D print a gun. How do you see the online community taking steps 
to police itself to avoid violent applications of 3D printing? I, I do get that question on a daily basis. Um, daily, wow. On a daily basis, yeah, yeah. First of all, let me be clear. You can 3D print a gun and it will blow up in your face. Um, 3D printing is a terrible technology for printing a gun, and I'll tell you why. 3D printing, as you can see here, is an additive technology. We're laying down materials layer by layer. What happens when you lay down materials layer by layer is that they can fall apart layer by layer as well. It's called delamination. They have no tensile strength. If you 3D print the barrel of a gun, it will blow your head off. Um, <laughs> Number one, that was number one. Number two, it's America. You can buy guns at Walmart, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> number three, if you really want to make your own gun, go to the hardware store and get a pipe. Now that is a great technology for a gun. So the truth is you've heard about these 3D printed guns. They're not 3D printed guns. They're a 3D printed part of a gun. The, the business end of a gun, the barrel and the bullet, you can't 3D print those. The now that, that's, uh, that, by the way, I, I, that was, I was being, I was, I was being pedantic. I was, I was attacking the example. The All big, fair the, points, the, though. The, but yeah. the bigger point is, you know, the, you know, we now sort of, you know, we can, there are some dangerous things you can 3D print. There's probably some nuclear power plant, et cetera, um, <laughs> or something like that. Just wait till 3D printers can print DNA. Coming, by the way, Craig, Craig Venter, it's called DNA synthesis, desktop DNA synthesis. There will come a day in our lifetime where the doctor sends you an encrypted email saying, saying, um, Here's the, vac the, 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 the flu vaccine today. Because this flu vaccine we get, this is a guess, right? This is, cool. they're, yeah. they're, they're guessing a season ahead what the flu vac the is going to be. What if they actually hear, here's what the flu vaccine, here's what the flu is right now. Here's an encrypted email. Send it to your desktop RNA. Would it be an RNA printer or a DNA printer? I don't know. Anyway, send it to your desktop bio, bio printer, and it'll print a little, a little vial of goop, put it in your orange juice, and you are really vaccinated. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> So another, another uh, uh, corollary to this, another question from the uh, floor, which I will augment, is with different forms of technology increasing faster than the government can regulate, how do you think governments can keep up with this race when considering the protections of human rights? My sort of augmentation to that is there was a report earlier in the week that a drone nearly got in the way of a jet landing at Kennedy Airport in New York. Um, the, the suggestion being that this sort of exciting technology can get ahead of existing regulations. Absolutely. And are you concerned about that? You know, absolutely, I'm concerned about uh, but, but, uh, that. But we have a long tradition of dealing with that. These are general purpose technology. This is a general purpose technology. You can print, you can print a dollhouse furniture, you can print something dangerous um, there. Um, uh, a computer is another, another general purpose technology. You know what you can do with a Mac? You can write a computer virus. And does Apple stop you from writing computer rights? Absolutely not. What does stop you? We have laws, right? You know, that is, we, we prosecute the use, not the technology. And I think that's, that's fundamentally what our obligation is as technologists. Our obligation is to create general purpose technologies and then inform and help those who are charged with protecting us, the regulators, police, and law enforcement, to do their job of keeping, of, 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 of restricting or sort of prosecuting malevolent, malevolent use. As, uh, speaking of uses, someone asks, what role will drones play? What interesting uses do people use your drones for? Yeah, um, I'm gonna give you two, two uses that kind of came out of left field. I did not expect them. So the first is the personal camera droid. Um, so you know how like Star Wars, they have these droids that follow you around. That's, well, actually, that's what ours do. Mm. It's called a follow me function. Um, and does, okay, last, does it, how many people in this room have a GoPro camera? or have a, have a friend or something. Aren't they awesome? Don't you just love your GoPro, right? Don't you wish your GoPro were 30 feet above and 30 feet behind you following you at all times? No. <laughs> you're at least when you're doing but cool stuff. I can see how someone might like at that. At least when you're doing yeah. cool stuff. So GoPros, GoPros take the most exciting moments of your life and render them in high def, beautiful video. You know, and you know what? If you're windsurfing, the best angle is 30 feet up and 30 feet back. So you put a little what we call a follow me box on your, looks almost exactly like this, a follow me box on your belt. Press the button, ding, the, uh, the drone comes out, positions itself 30 feet behind, 30 feet, and just follows you around with a camera on you while you do your awesome stuff, and when the battery gets low, it flies back to the, to, the, to the shore. So that's one function, GoPro with wings. Another function, and this one was a real surprise, agriculture. The number one commercial use of drones, I predict, is going to be agriculture, because it turns out farmers know nothing about their crops. The, the, sort of the, um, the consolidation of agriculture means the farms are massive. The abandonment of like, people from the farms means there's fewer people, fewer and fewer people managing larger and larger farms. And there's only two ways to manage a farm. That is, you know, sample it, which is walk up and down the road and look at the plants on the left and the plants on the right and hope that, you know, 
hope that sort of speaks for the crop as a whole, or the calendar. It's June, we spray herbicide in June. Um, as a result, we use way too much chemicals, way too much pesticides and herbicides. We use way too much water. We use way too much fertilizer. Um, we don't catch um, pest and, and disease outbreaks soon enough, and we don't, um, we don't harvest at the right times because we, we're treating the whole thing like a, because we don't know what's really going on with the crops. Um, what these things can do is you push a button and they just, uh, they, you know, they do this automatic crop survey. They do this lawnmower pattern, click, 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 stitch together so photos. So you're saying they're gonna get really good photographs as opposed to a satellite image. That's right, Google, imagine like a, like a, like a super high resolution Google satellite view of your farm every day for free. To what extent are these kind of inexpensive drones being used for um, spying both legal and illegal and uh, moving drugs illegally across borders? You know, I mean, the spying thing is, is I mean, that, that's the military application, and that's, that is what it is, and, you know, that we don't, we don't, we don't sell to the military or, or address that. So, um, uh, interesting, a lot of the concerns have been about police. Yeah, what about to municipal governments? You know, it's funny, the, um, uh, all, all, like, every example people give me, like, why, why drones are scary, these actually represent the last place the drones are going to be used. Do you know who the most regulated entity in America is? It's the government. The mm. government regulates itself mm -hmm. really well. So if you want to ban drones in Berkeley, good luck to you. Because let's say, let's say you're like, we have, we, we have rules about privacy in Berkeley. Guess what? You don't control your airspace. 15 inches, I think it's 15 inches off the ground, you're in federal airspace. It's called a national airspace. If you have a serious, if you have a good vertical leap, you're in national airspace. <laughs> <laughs> you're in FAA territory. And you've got this paradox of regulation, right? Mm -hmm. Privacy in America is a local thing based on community standards. And the airspace is federal. It's national. And the FAA couldn't care less about privacy. It's not in their mandate. So, you know, the, who can you regulate? You can regulate your police force. You can't stop your kids from going to Brookstones in the, you know, in the, in the mall on buying a parrot AR drone for 300 bucks, and by the way, it's hard to buy a flying toy that doesn't have a camera these days. You can't stop your kids from doing that, but you can stop the police from using these things. Chris, you're gonna love this one. Um, when speaking of the third industrial revolution, what do you foresee in terms of technology in education? Will teachers become obsolete, or books? Um, so, so glad it, you asked. I'm, I'm going to eventually answer your question, but I want to go on a little sermon right here. If I ask, <laughs> if I, if, you have four minutes. <laughs> if, I, if, you, if, if, if the powerful minds and, and influence of this, this, this room can do one thing, it is please do the following. Find a high school, a local high school, maybe a middle school, but I'll, let's start with a high school. Find a high school somewhere and talk to the teachers, the principal, and say, please take the computer lab you've already got, which has like a row of computers and then two laser printers at the end, and just add a 3D printer to that row. And the moment you add a 3D printer to the computer lab you've already got, that lab becomes a digital design lab. Same infrastructure, no new rooms, no new infrastructure. We're not going to try to rebuild industrial arts or shop class. No one loses their finger. All we're saying is just add one of these to the computer lab you've already got, and now suddenly kids know, will learn that same lesson that our kids, my kids have learned, which is anything you can imagine you can make real, and they are going to learn, not, you know, right now in the computer lab they're learning typing and PowerPoint. How about also learning a real 21st century skill, which is digital design? So let your schools be the example. Um, that would be totally transformative. That would bring relevant digital manufacturing skills back into our, our curriculum, and that would create a 21st century workforce that I would love to see. Um, that was not the question. The question was, what, is it, what, is it, what about the teachers? And books. And books, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I think that the, you know, this doesn't really have much to do with the maker movement, but I think things like Udacity and Coursera and OpenCourseWare and things like that have shown that there's really two elements of the, of, the, of the university education process. There is the curriculum, and then there is the experience. And the curriculum can be shared really broadly online, often for free. Now, it's not the entire university experience, but you know, the vast amount, most people in this world are not going to get into Stanford. They're not going to get into MIT, and they're not going to get into Harvard or anyplace else. Why should they be deprived of at least you know, a chance to, if they're sufficiently motivated, to teach themselves using the same materials? But will we still need teachers in that scenario? Um, well, I think that um, a Khan Academy, which is like, I, how many people have heard of Khan Academy? Yes. Much more great, than people who have great. 3D printers. Okay, so I don't need to tell you guys <laughs> yeah. that Khan Academy has done one profound thing, which is reverse the, the, direct, the workflow direction of fourth grade and, and a few other grades. But basically, <laughs> rather than, <laughs> Rather than sort of, you know, let, let's say we love teachers, right? But let's just say that they're not, the best, they're not all the best lecturers in the world. And we love parents, but let's just say they're not the best homework helpers in the world, right? I, I'm, you know, why not have 
why not have the internet, the best, the best you know, lecturers in the world put their lectures on the internet and kids can watch YouTube, which they want to do anyway, and let teachers do what they're really good at, which is helping kids with their homework. And so homework becomes classwork, and classwork becomes YouTube work, and that's the reversal of the workflow of, of, of school. That's, it doesn't replace the teachers, it just reassigns them from doing what they're, what, there's, what they're not super good at, by and large, which is giving inspirational world-class lectures that feel fresh every time, and puts them to what they are good at, which is helping kids in person, face-to-face, -face, on an individualized basis, do their own work. I have two last questions for you. The first is a short one, and the second one's a slightly longer one. First question. Uh, let's say that, statistically speaking, 100% of automobiles in the world today are made by uh, big, automo big automotive companies, maybe 99%. Mm -hmm. um, 50 years from now, what percentage will, uh, will that be? What percentage of, of, of automobiles will be made by what we would agree are big auto companies? 90%. Um, so the maker movement will have a small but meaningful impact on that. Again, cars are a tough, a tough, you uh -huh. know, a metric. Um, and, uh, ask me a different question. Like, ask me, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, you mean a different, a different thing. Well, uh, I mean, cars are just so tough. I mean, how many, air, what percentage of airlines are going to be made by, you know, airplanes. jet lines are going to be made by aerospace companies? And I think it's pretty close to, you know, 100%. Um, th th this is a highly regulated. We're talking about people's right. lives, high speed. It's, it's tough. What's an example of an industry, a manufacturing industry, that will be meaningfully impacted? Um, you know. Toys, you know, we're gonna, you know, I, I would say that, you know, like 50% of the toys your children, you know, 10 years now your children will get will not be made by toy companies. Very last question uh, from the audience. Earlier this year, Peter Thiel, the co-founder of PayPal, famously said that the idea machine or the rate of innovation has stalled. Do you agree? Uh, no, I love Peter Thiel. I, 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 I admire him tremendously. He is so wrong about this. I don't, I just, <laughs> So, um, there, you know, uh, in your pocket, this is going to sound a little wrong, there's this amazing revolution going on in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, what's going on inside smartphones, Moore's Law has never worked faster than it's working on in smartphone with MEM sensors, these, these gyros and et cetera, the in your pocket, the ARM processors, the GPS, the cameras, the, the, you know, the memory, the wireless. I mean, literally, I don't think Moore's Law has ever worked faster than it's working, thanks to the Apples and the Googles of the world. And those things right now, which are transformative enough, the supercomputer in your pocket is transformative enough, but those components have application everywhere else. This is the Internet of Things. It's the it's the it's the quantified self, the wearable health stuff. It's the big data movement. It is it is robots. Those things. That, that was the reason we can do flying robots for six hundred bucks. Is that they're smartphones with wings. Um, I've never seen innovation move faster. But he he right says now. you know so what? So I can get a reservation across town in a half hour with that, or I can have one of these things watch me play in my backyard. But. It's, I still can't go to the moon, and I'm, it still takes me about the same time to fly to London, and we still can't cure cancer. That's, that's his point with and the rate of innovation. And to that he co-founded PayPal with Elon Musk, who is going to take us to the moon. It's like he's, it's like he's just not paying attention. <laughs> I think you would all uh, agree with me that Chris Anderson may be many things, but he is not a man without opinions or tremendous <laughs> insight. And uh, please join me in thanking him. Here. Oh, thank you very much. What is this piece of plastic I'm holding? That's. Uh, oh, it's a Darth Vader. I see him looking at me. There that's, you go. That's Darth, Darth yeah. Vader. I decided to cut the top of his head off so you could see the honeycomb pattern inside. It's uh -huh. very cool. Okay. A con conservation of plastic. Um, I have a, a little a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge to impart to you. Our conversation tonight is the is a perfect introduction to a more detailed exploration of innovating for impact. Uh, we invite you to join us upstairs on the fourth floor terrace for a reception with some food and drink to meet a select group of Bay Area organizations who are designing and fostering innovative solutions to address social, environmental, and economic challenges around the world. Before we go, please don't leave yet, uh, let us introduce you to a few of those innovators, and I'll be back after this very short video. <laughs> 